Alors, chers amis, bienvenue à notre deuxième conversation euh, qui porte sur le thème de la communauté, la communauté de foi. Dans la lettre pastorale que j'ai émise il y a quelques semaines, euh, nous avons identifié la vie communautaire euh, comme étant un champ d'activité très important si nous voulons renouveler qui nous sommes dans notre façon d'être ensemble et par euh, la qualité de l'expérience vécue dans nos paroisses. Évidemment, l'important, c'est de passer, de faire la transition d'une paroisse qui est simplement une assemblée à devenir une communauté de foi, une communauté de disciples qui acceptent leur responsabilité d'aller euh, vers les autres comme disciples missionnaires. Dans cette deuxième conversation, j'ai le plaisir de jaser avec Sœur Noula Kani, qui est une sœur de charité d'Halifax. Elle est aussi euh, médecin. Elle a passé des années euh, à servir les enfants. Donc, elle est pédiatre de profession. Mais elle a été aussi professeure d'éthique et de morale à l'université. Dans sa vie actuelle, elle va un peu partout à travers le pays. Elle rencontre des prêtres, des laïcs, pour parler surtout de l'impact de la crise de abus, des abus sexuels sur l'Église et sur la vie communautaire. Évidemment, nous savons très bien comment cette euh, expérience de crise nous a affectés ici dans notre Église locale. Donc, c'est la personne qui est bien située pour nous parler pas seulement de la question des abus, mais plutôt, elle nous parle de comment euh, passer au-delà de ces obstacles et de ces problèmes pour nous aider à former une communauté qui est crédible, une communauté de témoins crédibles qui acceptent d'aller vers les autres en mission. Mais avant d'aller vers les autres, il faut savoir qui nous sommes et qui nous voulons être dans notre communauté locale. Donc, nous allons parler de la communauté de foi et ses implications pour nous tous. So welcome everyone. I uh, I'm pleased to uh, have Sister Nula Kenny with me uh, today. Uh, we're sitting in my library surrounded by the wisdom of the ages. <laughs> And uh, we, uh, we have come together to uh, have this conversation uh, about the second main point of the pastoral letter, which uh, focuses on community, the community of faith, the community that we are trying to uh, renew and rebuild uh, through our efforts uh, now of... Uh, a year or two of uh, new evangelization and transformation. And of course, the challenge now for all of us in various parishes and communities is to take all of this and to try to put it into some pastoral uh, planning and some actions uh, that we might accomplish. But uh, today, uh, our conversation is about community and what that might mean. Now, you've been here in uh, Halifax uh, for a long time, and uh, you've had a chance to observe uh, over the years the way the church has been locally. And you've also uh, been across the country, and you've seen the church up close uh, in various dioceses and provinces. And so I'm really happy to be able to have this exchange on community. And so I guess my, uh, my first uh, remark is, uh, is to ask you, how do you think this topic of community fits in with the gospel 
for uh, the fourth Sunday of Lent, which is uh, the story of the man right. born blind. <laughs> <laughs> well, remember, Bishop, you're asking that question of a retired doctor. So <laughs> the stories of healing and reconciliation are, for me, central to my understanding of the faith. And so I think there's a lot of link, not only with the notion of seeing and seeing properly, but also with the whole notion that Jesus has come to heal us. And in a very important way for me, all of his ministry is about healing, division, and reconciling us with the Father, with each other, and, and with the world in which we find ourselves. So I actually see lots of linkage. Um, and if I, if I were to preach, I would preach on those linkages because I think they're very real. Well, it's very interesting because in my reading of the story of the, of the man born blind, what struck me reading it this time was the fact that uh, it was more about the blindness of the community. Right and uh, their inability to cope with uh, the fact that something had happened to this individual. Absolutely. And I was just wondering how that community element uh, comes into the picture. It's interesting because if you, if you reflect on Jesus' cures, and I've had a chance to actually speak on this just recently, Jesus' cures have three characteristics that are absolutely relevant to your question. The first is Jesus does pay attention to our physical, mental, psychological illness, disability, dependence. He pays attention to our physical reality. But Jesus also in his cures restores to the person a sense of their own dignity, a sense of their own wholeness. But the third element of every single cure of Jesus is that he restores the person to the community. That there's, whether it's the leper who's unclean, the woman with the hemorrhage who couldn't even go into the temple because she was unclean, all of these, whether it's the man sitting by the waters waiting for someone to help him get in so he can be cured. The relationship between individual and faith is absolutely clear to me in all of scripture, but certainly whenever we talk about cure or community. Because I think the first thing that's if, you know, you asked about my own life experience. I'll be 50 years professor religious, a sister of charity next oh, year. Very good. So I've had different experiences of community, not only socially and personally, but in, in community. What I'm absolutely convinced of in my age and <laughs> wisdom, I hope, we need community for faith. I think it's absolutely correct that in our transformation in the diocese, we're focusing on discipleship. It, this has to be first and foremost some kind of personal encounter with Jesus. But in our world, we've forgotten that our faith is not just a personal encounter, that for it to be supported, nurtured, grow, for it to flourish in the times of our weakness, it is the faith of our mother and, and fathers. It is the faith of the community. We, we actually need the community to support and sustain our individual faith. And, you know, I've said often to folk when I hear this expression, well, I'm not a very religious person, Nula, but I'm very spiritual. Um, I don't doubt that that's possible. But for me and my experience of the human, it's only when you have the opportunity for dialogue, for sharing of faith, for the support of faith, for, for witness of faith, that your own faith constantly grows. Otherwise, there's this incredible tendency for it to be a me and God religion. And we're not that, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, it also, your comments bring out for me the importance of being able to be as clear as possible about what we mean by community. And what you've been saying and insisting on is that we are a community of faith. The reality is that all of us live in many communities right. at the same time, and they don't all mean the same word, but they don't all mean the same things. Right. So when we talk about the community of faith, you've just made some points that I think maybe need to be repeated, which is that the community of faith is an absolute essential for faith to grow, for faith to uh, be visible, for faith to be supported. How do we make those things happen in our parishes that may or may not be communities? 
Right. Well, you're absolutely right that you sit back and you look at the way in which the notion of community has been experienced by many people and the demographic changes that have occurred in the Western world, in Canada, in, in, in Nova Scotia, in our own Diocese of Halifax, Yarmouth. I mean, we have almost a decimation of rural communities. We have an urbanization. We have technology now. I mean, you see all these advertisements of, you know, if you want to get married and have it a stable marriage, go online for this website. People's <laughs> relationships and their experience of community. I have 2,400 friends on my friend page. I mean, we have d different notions of community. And so it becomes crucially important, I think, for us to reclaim this link between personal faith and communal experience and support and manifestation of the faith. Because for me, the very first thing that has to happen, if Jesus matters, then my relationships with you, with other priests in our diocese, with laity, with those who welcome me when I come to liturgy, with those who work for St. Vincent de Paul Society in the name of the church and justice, we have to be showing in the way we are with each other mm -hmm. that Jesus matters. We have to be showing the same kind of healing and reconciling, the unity in one faith, one baptism, one God who's father of all, and a unity of charity. So if we can't manifest that to each other, what good are we? We're, we're not salt for this wor world, that's for sure. Well, it, it makes me think of the remark that uh, uh, Father James made uh, last week where we made the distinction between a social club and, uh, and, 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 and a community. Uh, a community of faith has to be visibly different right. if it's going to draw people's attention so that others may wish to either be seekers or to inquire, uh, uh, you know, even out of curiosity, what makes the difference. So what does make the difference in a community of faith? Yeah, the first thing is how we are with each other. It's the way we speak to each other, the way we deal with difference of opinion, the, the way, in fact, we support each other in our weakness, the way we either can forgive or can't forgive. That happens in families, right? I mean, you the, must have, the, the fact the, that people run up against the block no, and, no, no, and no, they the, can't the, the and fact they can't that there's get anywhere. That, there's something that happened. There's an experience. There's a history. There's a judgment. There's a hurt. And people won't let it go. They won't move on from it. So even when you're presenting a new situation and a new opportunity that would be healthy, or holier, or happier, they can't, that's part of what's why forgiveness is so difficult, either to forgive or to be forgiven. Yeah, yeah. And, and, the, and the gospel says, uh, you know, whose sins you retain, they are retained. If you yeah. don't let it go, it, 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 it right. destroys you. And, and it destroys a parish if people can't get beyond the things that uh, are the obstacles. We, I think, have to understand in this day and age that we cannot depend, and I know you and I have talked about the whole issue of being Catholics and Christians in this post-Christian, post-Christendom world. We can't depend any longer on external social, economic, legal structures to support foundational notions of justice, care, fidelity, love, support, protection of the vulnerable. Mm -hmm. We can't depend on that. So the first thing that we have to do, Bishop, is we have to learn how to do that within the family of the faith. We have to be that for each other so that, in fact, what's shown is we do look different than other groups. Mm -hmm. Not in power and prestige, but in the way in which we attend to love, attention, forgiveness, care, concern. The, all of the things that Christ was, all of the things that he taught us to be. So for me, I think the biggest lesson for the Christian community today is we cannot any longer assume that the ways of Jesus are known, understood, or accepted by anyone. We have to show by our lives that it matters. You always use this expression, and the first time you really you puzzled me, <laughs> we've got to propose Jesus before we can preach him. 
Yeah. And I think this is absolutely relevant to, to this issue of community. If we're going to say it matters to be a Christian, then we have to show that in the way in which we are to each other so that we can manifest to the world that it changes you individually and as a community when you believe in this Jesus and try to walk in his footsteps. And God knows our world needs the ways of Jesus mm -hmm. because you can't look at the news, I mean, without almost weeping. Yeah, yeah. One of the points that you made which uh, strikes me is that you said we cannot presume anything. We can't take anything for granted. Right. What are some of the things that you're actually referring to? Like, what are the things that we take for granted that we should no longer be taking for granted if we're <laughs> going to be a community of faith? All right, well, that's a good one. What, <laughs> what do I think we take for granted? I think that we take for granted the notion that by baptism we are children of God, brothers and sisters, not only of Jesus, but of each other. We say that as, you know, we're the, I even you just used an expression I love, which is the family of the faith. Bishop, uh, families today are so complex, some of them so fractured. Um, family life has never been the ideal that people, but there's always been pain and suffering. So I think one of the things we assume is that a healthy, holy notion of the family of God is something that we understand we, and that we then automatically act that way. I think we have to begin to think a little more deeply about what does that mean? What does our baptismal commitment mean? Indeed, and what does it mean? I think it, it means we must, that we, it's no longer optional to be forgiving, loving, just, attentive to those who, who are most in need. It's not optional for us. It's not, I'll volunteer a few hours to the church this year, aren't I a nice person? As if you were volunteering for a, supporting a children's hockey club. Uh, good things. They're not optional for us. Mm -hmm. By baptism, each and every one of us has to understand if the family of the faith is to be lived as a family, supportive, just like families forgive, families do all of these things. If we're going to live that way, mm -hmm. the first mm -hmm. thing is we've got to then understand we've assumed that regularly going to Sunday for the people who do that is in fact fulfillment of our obligations. When it's not, our obligation is to participate yeah. in a new way of being with each other. But that gives us big challenges, Bishop, with issues of dialogue in the church, mm -hmm. forgiveness in the church, forgiveness of priests and people of each other, recognition of human weakness, and a re renewed commitment to be a force for justice in this very, very unjust at times world. Nula, just to pick up on, 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 uh, on a couple of things that you were saying around the family, uh, the family of faith, it's a very interesting uh, uh, descriptor. Uh, and, and I also uh, appreciated your remarks about how families aren't perfect. Right. Uh, we have a variety of families, and in this, uh, in, in, in one of our priorities uh, of the new evangelization is that we're, we're trying to focus on the importance of family and family life. But right. part of uh, the, the, the challenge is to deal with the need for reconciliation of people within that family and within that community. When it comes to the parish, uh, we, we, have, we have almost everywhere concrete situations where people are at each other's uh, throats right. and, and who are uh, more like members of a social club that don't want to give up this piece of authority or that dimension right. of what they've always done. How does all of this connect with this desire to renew our community of faith? Because after all, the whole point of this conversation and what we're doing is to bring parishes to come up with some concrete actions that they can uh, put in place so that they can become what we're talking right. about. So how does all this come together? Right. I mean, that's obviously that's the question. It's surely your question as, as bishop, but it's our question. We both mentioned forgiveness <laughs> and imperfection uh, individually, uh, in, in, in families, 
I think that if I go back over my life in the church, child of Irish Catholic immigrants, Catholic school, become a nun, come to Halifax, become a Sister Charity of Halifax, I actually think that we've talked more about the centrality of forgiveness than I personally have experienced as essential. Recently, in thinking of the Our Father, you know, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those. And I, I remember what, you know, or if you come to the altar and you realize that you've got something against your brother, you put your gift down at the altar, mm -hmm. go back and be reconciled, and then come to the table. I mean, you know, the Brits use the term gobsmacked. I, I, those two scriptures not long ago really got me thinking of we've made reconciliation and forgiveness and the ability to acknowledge we are sinners who need God's help. And, and that, in fact, unless we can manifest, because forgiveness can be so hard. I mean, yeah. violence and vengeance and forgiveness are so prevalent in our world, and sometimes in the name of religion. So I think there are ways that we, we need, and of course, Pope Francis has done an amazing job for me, amazing, identifying himself as a sinner when he's asked who he is, of naming this. So I think we need to pay a lot more attention to this because for me, Bishop, it's at the heart of a lot of this division. I'm perfect, and you're not. You I mean, are? And I'm <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's <laughs> Well, yeah, well, no, no. In, in parishes, we, we do this. Uh, I'm, I'm fully orthodox, but you, ah, uh, wait a minute, I don't like the way you do this, and I don't like the way you believe that. And somehow or other, there are legitimate differences, but they've been yeah. there since the beginning of the that's church. Right. That's right. We're not manifesting how to talk about those, how to acknowledge our weakness, and how to support each other in forgiveness. To me, that's a crucial question, and it's about how we talk to each other, what parish council, what parish dialogue, what, in, what does that really mean, priest and people, mm -hmm. um, and then how do we manifest forgiveness and, and weakness. And then, of course, there's the obvious, the practical. We have to be in the world doing something about visiting the sick, doing something about visiting prisoners, doing something mm -hmm. about feeding the hungry. And, and what, you're, what you're saying really brings us to the point of uh, inviting our parishioners to look at some of the how-to questions. Right. The practicality of a pastoral plan around the building and the rebuilding of community comes down to how are we going to treat each other? How are we going to be, I use the word in the pastoral letter, how are we going to be co-responsible? Right. It's not just the priest's job no. to make sure that everything is going smoothly. It's the priest and the laity coming together by uh, interacting adequately, and sometimes that includes being able to receive criticisms uh, mutually uh, on all sides. So that's the stuff that I'm hoping people will actually sit down at their parish council right. and with their friends and neighbors and say, how are we going to become the community of faith that the Lord is calling us to become at this time? And if we still hold on to the priests and the bishop do the holy stuff, they do the evangelization of the world, and we still have many who come, who come weekly, faithfully. For it's, it's your job. It's not my job. If we can't get rid of that notion and understand, if you're in a school as a teacher, if you're in the superstore as a salesperson, if you're helping someone in the hospital, the priest can't be that. The, the priest is priesting, that all of us have to do, contribute our gifts in the places in which we do manifest this love of Jesus Christ. We live in a post-Christian, post-Christendom world. And it's not that, it, that, that there aren't persons of goodwill in our world working for peace and justice. Sometimes they embarrass us because our, our efforts are so weak. But the reality is that if we are called to be followers of Christ, disciples of Jesus Christ, we are there not just for our own salvation, but to make this world a place where the reign of a merciful God, loving God, is for all. And I, I wish we could get it 
through our heads that the challenge for us now is not to be passive Catholics any longer. I mean, you address that repeatedly yeah. in, in your pastoral letters, right? Well, the focus of too many of our communities is themselves. And, and when you're central, your, 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 your focus is centered on yourself, then you're not going out. Pope Francis is uh, calling us to get out of our sacristies, do what we right. have to do. But sometimes what happens in a community is that they can't seem to get beyond the stuff that has caused them to be uh, at odds with each other. The unity principle uh, is no longer there. Right. And faith doesn't get passed on or communicated. And I think that one thing in my experience for myself and many others that helps move you out of yourself, our self-centeredness is when we actually go out and visit the sick. Sure. Go out and feed the poor. Not send a check. You go out yourself, you're, you, you experience something of what it's like to be in prison or to be newly released from prison. That gives you a humility yeah. that I think helps then turn your mind around with regard to not just the personal experience you had, but the insights about, imagine if we all did everything that we have been commanded in the Beatitudes and other teaching. Well, sister, thank you very much for all of this. I hope this will help us all to move uh, the challenge of transformation and the new evangelization a little bit closer to where the Lord is leading us. So do I. Alors, chers amis, cette deuxième conversation euh, autour de la lettre pastorale qui porte sur la communauté de foi, euh, elle est centrée sur l'évangile du quatrième dimanche euh, du carême. Alors, dans l'évangile de, de cette journée, euh, on, on nous rencontrons le Christ qui euh, aide l'homme, l'aveugle né. Et euh, ce qui m'a frappé en lisant l'Évangile, c'est pas tellement euh, le miracle du Christ qui donne la vue à cet homme qui est aveugle, mais j'ai été impressionné et marqué par le fait de la réaction des autres dans l'histoire de l'Évangile. C'est comme la communauté qui entoure cet aveugle né qui refuse de voir et de reconnaître euh, qui est le Christ à travers cette, euh, cette action, ce miracle de la part de Jésus. Alors ça me fait penser que pour une considération de l'Évangile et l'application de l'Évangile au thème de la communauté, euh, il serait bien de nous poser la question, quels sont les obstacles que nous devons affronter? Quels sont les points que nous refusons de voir? Parfois, dans nos communautés, euh, il peut arriver qu'il y a des choses qu'on insiste euh, à faire comme on a toujours fait, et euh, on est aveugle, dans un sens, à les possibilités d'autres manières de faire. Alors, il n'y a personne qui est aussi aveugle que celui qui refuse de voir. Est-ce qu'il y a dans nos paroisses, dans votre paroisse, des choses que nous avons besoin de voir et de voir clairement pour considérer les pas que nous devons prendre et les décisions que nous devons faire pour aller de l'avant et devenir une communauté de foi, une communauté de disciples qui acceptent d'aller vers les autres